first, they really dissuaded me from moving to LA when I told them, hey, I kind of do want to follow more in the footsteps of Orion Seacrest and go do entertainment news reporting. They're just like, oh no. What you have to do is you have to start out in a tiny market and work your way up and put in your 10 years and then maybe a giant market like LA will take you more seriously. There's no way you could just move out there and become an entertainment news reporter. And I guess I just, I really like it when people tell me I can't do stuff because I see it as a challenge and I like to show them up when they're wrong. The New School. The New School. The New School. The new school. This is The New School with your host, Christine Hong. Welcome to a new kind of school where we talk about career paths you don't normally get to hear about in the classroom. Every episode, I talk to someone with an interesting life path and learn about how they got to where they are today. Hey guys, happy Monday. I'm your host, Christine Hong. And today I'm gonna talk about something I watched a lot growing up. I used to binge these interviews with my favorite celebrities on TV and YouTube. I always wondered, what's it like to be the person on the other side interviewing the celebs on the red carpet? So I get the answers today from Sanyi Ren. She's achieved her hosting dreams as a Disney Channel movie surfer and as a regular Hollywood reporter on the red carpet and award shows. She's interviewed numerous stars, including Sandra Bullock, Ryan Gosling, Ryan Reynolds, Tom Cruise, Chris Pratt, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Billy Bob Thornton, Jordan Peele, Sama Hayek, Greta Werwig, and much more. She's also been featured on The Ellen Show and Jay Leno Show. In this episode, we chat about how she started her career in entertainment, how she achieved her hosting dreams, and what's like being a multi-hyphenate in Hollywood. When did an interest in like hosting or entertainment in general begin for you? I guess when I was younger, I was really introverted. So I would run for student government to push myself out of my comfort zone more. And I remember in high school, freshman year, I gave myself this goal of like meeting at least one new person every single day through the school year. And just like go up to them in the hallway, introduce myself and talk to them. Then I was the freshman class president and it gave me a chance to meet people. I guess maybe it was like giving these speeches in public all the time. I know a lot of people are afraid of public speaking, but I always just had fun with it because Maybe my mindset is like, no one's like trying to find a reason to laugh at you. No one's against you. Everyone's interested in hearing what you have to say. And so when you're on the microphone in front of people, then you have their attention. And it's so rare because people's attention spans are all over the place. So you have their attention and you must say something that matters or that can motivate them or inspire them because you don't want to waste that moment. But... Public speaking, it's like you're talking, but Mm -hmm. hosting, it's like two people are talking back and forth. So how did you end up pivoting there then? I guess with my mom. So she kind of planted the seed in my head because I think I had told her that I was interested in writing and acting and she saw I liked the public speaking so much. My mom said, oh, maybe you could be a news reporter. So I explored more internships in the hard news world, like at CBS. I just realized hard news is not for my personality because I'm a very positive person and I don't want my life to be spent like telling stories that are slightly more negative. I guess that's kind of when I realized hosting was a potential avenue too, where you get to dive into these human interest stories and you get to know people and help make them feel like they matter. Like again, giving them that voice. Because to be honest, you know, I remember my internships at CBS, like some of the reporters there, they'd be like, oh, this is so boring. This is a very slow news day. Oh, let's hope something like insane happens. I'm like, why would you want to spend your life hoping for stuff to happen just so you can report on? But I get it. It's like their work. Yeah. Well, no. And going even deeper into that like I remember one day there was like a county fair that like a ferris wheel or a roller coaster got stuck for two hours and the news teams they're just like oh we can't wait to report on it we hope we find someone who really had to pee or like couldn't hold it in and just, yeah like, we hope someone fell yeah, or died. Yeah. Yeah. and I was just like why why and wait I, how old were you when you were interning at CBS are, oh so I remember that was the summer after my freshman year of college and I remember I really mm. hounded the local news station in San Francisco CBS because they said so many of the local news stations like ABC CBS Fox and NBC, they only were allowing interns who were junior or senior year already. But I just knew I wanted that internship experience. So I just, yeah, I really hounded the woman at CBS. And it's so funny because they're Facebook friends now. You cold emailed them or how did you do it? I guess I looked on their website and yeah, I, I suppose it was a very cold email. I don't even remember if maybe I printed out a letter and like mailed it to her. But I'm just really thankful she took a chance on me because I did yeah. emphasize. I said, I know you guys only 
only want juniors or seniors, but I want to work in your department specifically because she was in charge of public relations and communications and she was the head producer of the weekly talk yeah. show. It was called oh. Bay Sunday and it was like a talk show format for the Bay Area, like artists, activists, authors, just yeah. everyone in the community. And we would have three guests every week. What did you do as an intern there? I researched a potential guests to have on and communicated with them and like helped think up the questions for the host. Nice. So you got to see what the news side was like and what this weekly talk show was like. And you realized that you wanted to be more like on the talk show after that summer? It felt like it was a better energy because, again, people really like telling their life stories and they're passionate about their causes that they're championing. And it's really neat to see people have a purpose because I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, it just really inspires you and it makes you feel good. Whereas with, yeah, the new stuff, you're kind of like, oh. Like, this is so heavy. You just feel like you want to go home and crash after it's not, like, as uplifting or inspiring. Got you. Wait, so what did you do after you came to this realization? I guess I had, like, a lot of realizations because then I was just producing three shows for our campus TV station. And one was called Love at Harvard, which was, like, a dating show. Nice. Like, the dating game. And I was hosting and producing that. What does producing even involve? Oh, so then that was finding the contestants for the show, like getting the location, and it was pretty easy at school. We could just like rent a common area space out for an hour or two. And find a camera person. Yeah. yeah, and I had to learn how to edit all my own stuff too. I was learning iMovie, I was learning Final Cut Pro, and I didn't even own this equipment myself because I had like a very old PC. And so I just used the resources at the student library. And then I did produce a talk show too because I realized at Harvard, we would get these really great alumni speakers coming to visit on campus and they would get invited to come talk to us. And I just would ask if they could set aside like half an hour or an hour so I could sit down and interview them. It's very them. smart using the student alumni angle too. You're like, you want to help a fellow student, right? Yeah. yeah. So I still remember my first interviews there. It were like Chris Matthews and like John Lithgow and Blair Underwood and Lionel Richie. And yeah, it was really great. It was a cool experience. I remember I was so nervous though. The first few times, like my interview with Chris Matthews, I'm like, it's so embarrassing. Because I'm, like, not listening to him at all. I'm just thinking of my next question that mm, I want to say. That's real. Listening is the hardest part. Wait, so you were having all these, like, shows. You are getting great hosting experience from school. But how did you make that transition to, like, the real world? I moved to L.A. without a car or a job or an apartment. And you still don't have a car. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I still don't have a car. I, I had, like, a roll of quarters for bus money to go on all my meetings with agents. Then I got an internship that was like super unpaid. Ugh. Yeah, but it was informative because I saw in our alumni newsletter, there was a producer and writer for the TV show White Collar, mm -hmm. and he wanted to develop his own projects too. And he just needed an intern for the summer. So I was like, okay, I could spend like three months interning for him. And at the same time, it worked out because my sister was graduating from grad school in UCLA that summer and her apartment lease wasn't up until September 1st. So I told myself, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give myself three months to find a job and an apartment and agents and get acting off the ground. And this is my timeline. And I'm just so grateful that, yeah, it worked out. And I've been living in this apartment now for seven years. But yeah, so I guess with that, internship. Then I got to sit into the writer's room and watch these writers brainstorm the arcs for a show that I did not personally follow. And I really liked seeing them all brainstorming together and really ideating and creating. So I learned a lot in that sense. And then when the internship ended, my boss, he said his wife needed an intern and she was working at a development production company on the Disney ABC lot. So I got to see a lot of her job too, where she was reading scripts and meeting writers every day and working with them on their pitches to pitch show ideas to ABC. And I really liked that. I was like, oh, it'd be so cool to just be able to read scripts every day and analyze what's good and bad about them. Yeah. And then 
at the same time, though, I got this, like, the hyphenate life. You're very much the multi-hyphenate life, yeah. Yeah, I was just, like, also going on auditions, and what ended up happening was then I left uh, that woman because I got into the NBC page program, and I was interviewing at the time concurrently for East Coast and West Coast, and I felt very fortunate to get into both of them. I was faced with this choice of New York or L.A., New York or L.A., and I decided to just really plant my roots in L.A. I was like, I have my apartment, I have the agents and manager on my team, and I'm starting to audition. I want to audition more. Like, LA is where it's at for me. Yeah. So I chose the West Coast Page program. It's been around for a very long time within NBC, the studio, and it's very much a pipeline program where I guess a lot of the executives, they start out as pages, then work their way up to assistant or coordinator or like then to SVP, oh. MVP. So it's a way to give people a start into the business? Yeah, and okay. you get to rotate between different departments. So the East Coast page program, you could work on shows like SNL and the news. Oh, wow. What did you learn the most from that program? Oh, <laughs> I learned that I don't want to work an office job. <laughs> That's what I learned. I love how a lot of your jobs are like figuring out what you don't want, but it is process of elimination. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I guess it's like you do have to go through it in order to not have regret over not having tried it and to reinforce the faith in yourself to do something that may be more unorthodox. Were you still continuing hosting? Because I know you were like a Disney Channel movie surfer and you've interviewed on so many things. So I'm, I'm confused where that comes in. So here's what happened. I remember I was getting auditions and I just had to schedule my bosses in meetings while I had auditions and I would run out and take a break and go audition then come back and there was one day where I had three auditions it was like an Xbox commercial callback in Hollywood and then like a Wells Fargo bank commercial in like near Pasadena and then a co-star role audition at ABC for a TV show called Super Fun Night that was at the WB lot and I was like wait so I'm gonna have to run out three times in one day like why can't this just be my normal life like why don't I just make this my normal life you didn't want to work at an office job yeah yeah you know, being an assistant I'm like that's always a good backup plan to have because it's still related to entertainment but why do I want to assist other people when I could be building up my own life and I could be freelancing at the time the pages are all contractors so it gets to a point where you're like maybe you could make more money just freelancing and getting yeah. your own clients and doing your own thing setting your own schedule and have that freedom and flexibility it's almost like I could see how people get enticed into office jobs because of the benefits and the stability and that paycheck. But like, yeah, as a contractor, I'm just, I guess now looking back on it, thankful that there weren't benefits to entice me into staying <laughs> longer. I like to build my own structure and go from there. And then what ended up happening here was like that really was the universe telling me, hey, this is the right step for you to take. Because I remember I planned on leaving the page program after a year in I started October 2012. I was like, okay, I'll leave October 2013. So July and September, I'm putting in the inroads to leave and pick up new clients. So July, I started working with Amazon Studios as a story analyst, just reading TV comedy pilots for them and writing reviews. And then in September, a contact of mine told me about CCTV, China Central Television. Right, China's biggest news network. Yeah, okay. like uh, government owned and everything. They tell us it was like 300 million households and at the time I was just like okay well let me send them my channel one newsreel and see if they want to like maybe take a chance on me to be a reporter for them and I was just so grateful because the head producer he was just like oh you know I like your reel and we don't really need to do an interview officially why don't you just come to this red carpet tomorrow on a Saturday morning in Westwood and we'll see what interviews you could get us and how you write up your intros and outros and perform them on camera and that'll be like your audition for the job and I was just like whoa because back at CBS so many of the mentors they really dissuaded me from moving to LA when I told them hey I kind of do want to follow more in the footsteps of Orion Seacrest and go do entertainment news reporting they're just like oh no what you have to do is you have to start out in a tiny market and work your way up and put in your 10 years and then maybe a giant market like LA will take you more seriously there's no way you could just move out there and become an entertainment news reporter and I guess I just I really like it when people tell me I can't do stuff because I see it as a challenge and I like to like show them up when they're wrong uh -huh. so you're interviewed to get this entertainment reporter job at 
this biggest news company in China with 300 million viewers. You just had an interview a few celebrities on the red carpet. And what do you mean by writing up a good intro and outro? Oh, so then it, when we're on camera as the reporters, there are the stands, like the stand-ups. I guess it's just their term for it. And the stands are just like, oh, you know, here we are right now at Westwood at this premiere. And we're about to go see this, this, and this, and meet this, this, and this. Like, come with me. And then that's the, like, middle stand or intro. And then the outro is usually like, oh, wow, that was such a wild ride. And, okay, reporting live from Hollywood, seeing you Yuan. And just, like, creating that in the package because you have to bookend the package and yeah. take people along because you will have the voiceover, like, carving out the package or playing. Yeah. Why was that the focus instead of the actual interview? I just feel like a lot of the job is researching the actual project and people that you're about to interview, then writing up the stands to put into the package, then doing the interviews, and then listening to the interviews, picking out the sound bites, and then structuring the script around that. And then that's your package that you build. Yeah. So he liked your reel, so he knew that you could be a host, but what's a good intro? What's a good interview? What's a good outro? Like, how did he judge those? I guess he just wanted to see how dynamic I could be on camera when I'm delivering these more scripted lines that I've written myself. Yeah, and mm, to make it feel like you're improv Yeah, basically. yeah. I feel like it looks easy and doing it is hard, basically. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is definitely hard when you kind of have to shut out everyone else around you because those red carpets are just so much stimuli coming in from everywhere because there are other reporters there. There are, like, people taking selfies on the red carpet and all the, like, loud photographers and just, like, publicists running around. And you kind of do just have to shut it out. And, again, it's like that public speaking where you can't think that, oh, everyone's watching me or everyone's waiting for me to fail. You're just like, no, everyone's doing their own thing. I got to do my own thing. This is a job. Let's knock it out. Yeah. So did you get the job? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I yeah ended up getting a chance to report at the award shows, junkets, like red carpets. And yeah, at the be next to Ryan Seacrest. And so I got that in September 2013. But here's what happened. So in January 2014, I'm still freelancing, like really working my butt off, like trying to say yes to every single gig that comes. Yeah. Even though I was starting with them as a reporter, I had no way of knowing how many events they would have per month, like how many times they would need me specifically. I didn't know when my next paycheck was going to come in. And I was just submitting a lot to like non-union projects because I wasn't in the union at the time. I submitted yeah. to like non-union like print ads and commercials. And plus then yeah. I had the attention to devote to like self-submitting for projects too. And then in January, I remember January 2014. So four months later, basically. Yeah. yeah then I saw a casting call for Disney Channel Movie Surfers. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and then I was just like, wait, I remember this because when I was 12 years old, I went to Disneyland with my family, and we came off of Pirates of the Caribbean, the ride, into a gift shop, and we just saw on TV there was this one movie surfer who was Asian-American sitting across from Johnny Depp, like around my age, interviewing him, and I was like, hey, if Disney's open to putting a face like mine on camera, then why not mine? What ended up happening was with Disney, then I saw that that breakdown come through on LA casting and I remember I just it was like well my agents probably submitted me to this too but I am going to go and google the casting director on this Lori records and I'm gonna <laughs> google her I found her website I found her email and I just pitched myself and I had my link to the channel one newsreel and I just saw in the breakdown for casting they were looking for a young Maria Menounos or a young Ryan Seacrest and I was just like hey I'm your young Ryan Seacrest young Asian Maria Menounos I'm here <laughs> they had said they need someone who can improv and think on their feet and also someone who can memorize a lot of copy because Disney is very particular about what you can and can't say on camera right and how they want to represent their projects and so she was like yeah we need someone who's not only an actor who can recite stuff we need someone who can be more spontaneous and also think like a producer to a degree and I was just like yeah that's me and I sent off this email and then I really I honestly I prayed for like five minutes and I was like god if this is where I'm meant to be please show me a sign and I trust you and then 10 minutes after, Lori emails no me way, back directly. Yeah, and she's just like, I would love to meet you first thing, Monday. 
And it was a Friday when I sent her that email. And then I remember immediately after that, I get a call from CCTV saying, hey, we have to do like a set visit to Castle, the TV show on Monday. Are you free? I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm not free for that. And then I get a call from a commercial that was shooting like all throughout LA, like in Pacific Palisades, Santa Monica, like Runyon Canyon. And they're just like, oh, we want to book you for an all day shoot. And it was like a good amount of money where I almost was just like, I can't say no to this now. I was like, I already said no to CCTV and like this shoot just sounds like so much fun. So I told them also very honestly, I said, hey, I have this really big interview. I have to do this audition on Monday, but I also want to work on your project. Is there any way we could find a compromise? And thankfully, the producer was so nice. He was just like, Where's your audition? I'll just make sure to structure our schedule so when we're in Hollywood shooting, I was just like, I would have never, ever, ever gotten that treatment at NBC. And this is why I'm making like the right decisions in my life because yeah, NBC, I'd have to be forsaking my lunch to go on this audition and no one would care. And no one would be so supportive and encouraging. I remember that was such a good day because I went on that shoot and it turns out one of the other actors on that shoot, he heard me rehearsing my lines in the car for the Disney Surfers audition. And he was like, hey, are you going in for Disney Channel Movie Surfers? Because I just went into that earlier last week. And let me tell you everything you need to know and expect. Oh, what did he say? He was just like, so Lori, when you get there, she's either going to ask you to interview her pretending to be Johnny Depp or interview her about her own life. I was like, oh, everyone loves talking about themselves, and I want to hear more about her life in casting. So I Googled her some more and saw she was celebrating her 20-year anniversary of casting. So when I'm in that room with her, I just opened with, oh, hi, we're here with Lori Records. Congratulations on your 20th anniversary casting in L.A. What an adventure. Yeah, Yeah, and then immediately she's just like, oh, my gosh, like, well, has it been 20 years? Like, oh, wow, you've really done your research. And so if anything, I think just in life, it's good to be honest and to do your research and... I still remember when I was 12 years old and I saw that segment of Disney and movie surfers and there was no Google back then. So I just, I think I went on Yahoo Answers and Mm -hmm. I searched how to become a Disney Channel movie surfer. Yeah, (laughs) so it's so full circle. At 12, you like literally searched on Yahoo Answers how to become a Disney Channel movie surfer. And then you got the gig from submitting to casting. You emailed her. Yeah, I emailed her and I like, pitched myself directly. Right, so, and your agent submitted you and you didn't, you didn't get anything from the agent. You had to submit yourself. Exactly. She corresponded with me. And then, so the thing is, my agents did submit me. So she did go through my agents when she was communicating from there on out. But yeah. also, she would email me specifically. Like, I remember I auditioned in January and I wasn't hearing back in February. And every single morning, I was waking up on pins and needles, like, not sure of what to expect and so impatient and then I remember in like mid-February she emailed me directly and she was like hey we're having a hard time finding like potential male hosts because we have our like selects for the females and you're in our top five so please just stay on hold like we'll probably get a call back in March and I don't remember if I heard anything in March she did keep me post it throughout where she was like yeah you know still checking in like you know they really want to shoot some segments soon but we do need you to go to the next callback round and then I check my email and then I see I have that callback for movie surfers and they just had for the callback they gave me like 20 questions to memorize and guide the interview as such in the room. Ooh, what were they? I'm so curious. It was really cool because they wanted all of us who are auditioning for the gig to just interview one of the current movie surfers about a set visit she had done Mm, and like um, interact with her and be free and fun and in the moment. And here's a lesson that I've learned from my mom (laughs) where we love watching the winter Olympics and we love watching figure skaters do what they do. And my mom is always just like, Oh, you see the ones who are just living the joy of performing and doing what they love fully and if they mess up if they trip up if they stumble then they get back up right away and they keep going and they feel like they can improvise and flourish with the audience and go off of the audience connection and the vibe and energy and you see at the end they stick the landing and I was just like that's almost how I see the interview and how I choreographed the interview that I did for that callback because I was just like well here I have the basic elements the technical elements that I know I have to hit, but I also can go off script and enjoy it and just like show my fun loving personality and like how thankful I am to get this opportunity to audition for something that for 12 years I'd been harboring in the back of my mind as an opportunity that I would have loved to have. And I remember leaving that 
call back feeling like I left everything in the room and I was like, there's no way I could have done any more than what I already did. And that's a very rare feeling for me to have because usually when I leave auditions, I'm always like, oh shoot, I should have done that. Oh man, why didn't I do that? Oh, like, oh, why is my best audition always like the one in the car coming back? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that was like this one very rare moment where I felt like either they're going to like me or they won't, but at least I did my best and what I could. And then a week later, they're just like, oh, we want to shoot our first segment with you. And it's for Million Dollar Arm. And that's the like baseball movie. Oh, with so you the, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just started feeling so overjoyed. And yeah, again, just so thankful. And what that. does that mean when you get it? Like, do they guarantee a certain amount of interviews? Or how does that work? Are you just on their roster? I uh, was told I was on their roster. And yeah, they just uh, did so many segments. They would rotate in between different hosts. Yeah, and I really loved the production team because I worked directly with the production team. And every time they always had like one or two reps from the clients from Disney, like there too. But for the most part, it was the production team who was writing the scripts and directing the segments. I remember feeling so, so insanely grateful and just like, oh, is this real life? And I guess that experience taught me a lot of things where it's like, oh yeah, be patient. And like what's meant to be yours will be yours. Stay thankful. And again, I guess I am just really glad that I listened to my heart and left NBC. How did you do all the interviews on the red carpet? Like, I've seen you do these one-on-one -on -one interviews with all these really cool celebrities. How did you get those gigs? Oh, yeah. What we did with Disney was they were all set visits or, I guess, like, interactive pieces mm -hmm. where we had to immerse ourselves in an activity like go zip lightning 500 feet in the air, despite me having a fear of heights. I only could do it when the cameras were rolling, when they turned the camera off and they were like, okay, now you guys zip line to lunch. I was frozen on the platform <laughs> for half an hour. I was like, you shouldn't have told me the camera's off. You should have just told me we're still rolling. Oh <laughs> Otherwise, I will freeze and I can't do it if it's not for work. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's dedication. Yeah, and those set visits were fun because I got to meet the Avengers. That was neat. But with wait, this, like all the Avengers? I a good number of them. Like I remember Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth. I remember with Chris Hemsworth, he was funny because he was like just massive as a person. He's like a giant. And then my director was just like, maybe we should dig a hole for you to stand in so you can be like eye level with Sandy. And even in the Instagram photo I have, it's like his bicep is bigger than my head. <laughs> it's like kind of intimidating. So I've done set visits for Disney. I've also done set visits for CCTV and all the red carpets and junkets are from CCTV for movies that are getting promoted in China. And one of the recent set visits I did for CCTV took me to Australia for Aquaman. Yeah. And that one was a lot of fun because we got to like dress up as one of the soldiers in the film and put on like 70 pounds of, of yeah. wardrobe. So did they just email you and they're like, hey, you have to be here in a week. We're going to fly you out. You're going to interview this person. Here's the research you should do. Do they give you questions you should ask like how does that work yeah so Disney they definitely really were much more regulated where they always had the questions prepared the potential segments even the alternates oh so you didn't improv at all with Disney oh we were allowed to improv too but we also did have to know all of these alt lines and oh, the they look so natural lines. okay you have to memorize the questions That's yeah cool. yeah and it's really fun I guess with CCTV I definitely have to do a lot more work on my end where I always just come up with the questions give them to my producer if she has any changes she wants to make, then she'll make them. And she's like very smart and sharp too. Like she actually gave me the best advice I ever got. And I forget if I told you this before too, but she said, oh, just always in an interview, approach it as if you're catching up with an old friend who you haven't seen in a while. So that's cool. You got more control with CCTV because you came up with your questions, right? Yeah. And what's funny is with them though, they also were a bit more regulated too in terms of like, oh, what you can and can't wear on camera. Like I know for me and CCTV, they had some qualms at first because they thought I looked kind of young. Mm. And they're just like, oh, you do have to dress older. You have to present yourself older. Like, oh, don't wear those flower earrings or don't wear that headband or uh, like don't laugh so much when you're <laughs> talking to someone. I'm like, what? Okay, fine, whatever. Or like when I'm recording my voiceover for the packages, like, oh, speak from the lower register because mm. I can't my voice high pitch. <laughs> 
So I feel like I definitely had so much experience like working with different outlets that have their rules and regulations, but I think it just comes with the territory of this is a brand and this is what they want you to advance and you can't go off brand. And actually that is yeah. why like a new gig I have picked up like the trivia hosting at pubs throughout LA. Right. Like that has been very liberating in terms of I can wear what I want to wear. I can say what I want to say. Like I could make this show in my style and everyone is here just to have fun and the nice. stakes are low. It's been very freeing for me as an individual and helped me like get in a better mind space. Cause I think I am that person still from when I was little to now I'm like that goody two shoes who just like wants to follow the rules. And yeah. so the more rules someone imposes on me, the more approval and validation I'm trying to get. Yeah. Cause Disney, they even wrote your questions for you and they restricted your wardrobe. Oh, they, yeah, yeah. Did they say what the goal of the interview was? Or? Oh, I mean, you know, I think they just wanted to make the movie that we're talking about or the app that we're talking about look fun and engaging and gotcha. just like, yeah, make it seem accessible to audiences. Like, hey, here's the movie making magic. You're like, oh, here, we're behind the scenes right now. Like, this is Video Village. This is where the director watches all the takes. And, you know, just like, hey, we're on a real live set. Like, even though you'll see the jungle on screen, it's all really just blue screen around us. So you're just taking the audience on an adventure and yeah what was the goal for cctv how did you decide how to write the questions yeah so with that one i know that one my producer definitely like gave a lot of feedback on those so we again just wanted to make it look fun and entertaining and the goal honestly with a lot of these interviews is to ask different questions that no one else is asking okay. because there's so many times where yeah these actors are tired of answering the same question like oh what motivated you to take on this character or how did you relate to this character but in Instead, you should be asking more fun things. Or, oh, you know, something else that helps me a ton is, like, if we don't have time to watch the movie beforehand, then I just have to watch the trailer. And I really will just go down those comments on YouTube and see what other people were, like, voting up and liking and what the real fans are saying. Like, when we've reported at Comic-Con, it's been very tough because I don't have time to binge all of these shows that we're covering. Right. And so I will just look up, like, the synopsis of the most recent finale and see, like, what fans fans were saying and like what caught them most off guard and kind of bounce off from there because in a sense you have to embody the mindset of someone who's excited about this content because you're like the people who are watching this are the ones who are either already fans or like soon to be fans like what are people curious about and you just like chase those questions and then how do you mesh them together decide the order of the questions I guess I kind of try to lead with the ones that I like even just personally find the most interesting or the one that I think will make them like you just pause and wonder <laughs> and yeah have to like dig in their own brain to figure it out. I'm trying to think of some of like my favorite questions that I've asked people now like I really like when we do the more animated films. I think even yeah with Chris Pratt for the Lego movie franchise I think I just asked him because I know he's a dad and I'm just like well the lesson of the Lego movie really seems to be that we find the most joy when we're all just like kids at heart so how do you try to impart that lesson to your son? Which one have you been the most nervous for beforehand? After doing the entertainment news reporting now for like five six years I think probably Tom Cruise was still the most <laughs> okay. nerve-wracking. Why? Because as I guess Tom Cruise <laughs> I mean, he seemed like he had great energy, and I just remember thinking, okay, I really want to make this fun, like, let me memorize my questions back and forwards. It's not, like, so much of a performance, but it's like you figure out the the rhythm and the cadence of it, and you want it to not look too well orchestrated, it's still organic, but also have that structure. So I remember with his interview, I just really wanted it to go well. <laughs> All right, what is the most difficult decision you've had to make to fulfill your destiny? Oh, <laughs> a difficult decision. I think the difficult decision is not being with my family because I am such a family-oriented person. They're like an hour flight away, San Francisco, right? Exactly, but I mean, I guess it still feels like you're missing out on these little daily nuances of your loved one's lives because you could text each other, you could call, you could catch up, but there is something very different about not living in the same space and inhabiting that physical world in each other's vicinity. Yeah, I like love my mom and sister so much. Aww. And like even when we went to Disneyland, all the time, every summer, it was always the three of us. 
so I feel like, uh, yeah, it's like hard being away from them. So yeah. I also do want to commemorate my mom's story in a uh, coming of age script that I've been working on for a while. Cause with this screenplay, I, it took me so long to write it. Like I just didn't want to write it cause I didn't think it was interesting. But now that I've written it, it has been getting more traction and like the Sundance labs picked it up for the second oh, wow. round. So I just submitted the full script to them. Yeah, and, and Sundance is like the biggest indie film festival, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would really love to take part in their screenwriting lab if they'll have me because I guess just this story it's very much based on my personal story it's almost like an Asian Gilmore Girls nice because I just love how single moms are lovely wonderful people and they're superheroes and I think they really lack a love letter in the industry where a lot of times yeah. they're portrayed poorly in the media as the villains or the reason why the protagonist's life is messed up or they're abusive yeah, yeah. or they're abused and yeah. I'm just like no I know single moms myself like my friends yeah. or friends who are raised by single moms and they are just the most hardworking individuals and we should not do a disservice to them and their stories and so with the story I'm working on it's based off of yeah, again, my personal story, because it follows a high school senior who gets into her dream college, Harvard College, but she's been raised by her single immigrant mom. In order to qualify for the financial aid that she needs, she has to fill out a form called the non-custodial parent form. And so she goes on a journey to look for these answers and to find the dad she's never known. It's loosely based on my story. It's just the last time I saw my dad was when I was eight years old. And so my parents divorced then and he said he wanted to still be a part of my life. And then we like saw him for one Christmas and he bought us a bunch of toys at Toys R Us and then never came back. And then, yeah, so. And you can't even communicate or text or email him anymore? No, so the thing is that's that's why the non-custodial parent form was so frustrating for me because it's asking you all these questions like, oh, well, the parent you don't live with, how much do they make per year? Like, yeah, what's their yearly income? What, Where are they located? What's their occupation? I was like, I don't know the answers to any of these questions. And I just thought it was a bit of a... Oh, yeah, tough form to have to face because I just want to go to college and I want them to give me financial aid. And I like, you know, it costs more than my mom's yearly salary to attend one year at Harvard. So I need the financial aid. Yeah, what an intriguing premise. So I'm wondering if there's anything you were ashamed about or feared embarrassment in when you were starting your career, doing your career. I guess I'm such like an open book. I really like to talk about everything. I really love being transparent. Like nothing causes you shame. Yeah, I just feel like, you know, we all have such limited time in this world. Like, why should we feel ashamed of anything? I do think everyone should chase their happiness and their dream. But then I guess when I first gave that advice to people who wanted to come out here and pursue acting or hosting, maybe I made it sound too easy. And they're just like, no, that's not practical. But now whenever I do give people advice, it is more couched in pragmatism where I say, oh, make sure you have your survival job ready. Like, make sure that when people are asking you how acting is going, that you know your own personal victories. Wait, so what's next for you? I uh, am looking for funding for that independent film. And one of my good friends, she was a producing fellow at the Film Independent Project Involve, and I knew her from the PAGE program. So she's been coming on board to give me notes for the script. And I just, yeah, I want to be able to find funding. We have a $1.04 million budget, so it fits under the SAG modified low budget. And we also have the diversity incentive involved, so we can... Yeah, just really propel our stories. Nice. Yeah. Wait, didn't you just get BuzzFeed pilot made or something? Oh, yeah, that's my other uh, fun project that I just wrote because I wanted to, because I've lived in L.A. without a car for seven years. I always was like, oh, if I write a memoir, it's going to be called Carless in L.A. Because <laughs> no one ever thinks it's possible. But I just really love the conversations I've had in Ubers and Lyfts with people on my way to and from, like, these red carpet events. So I was just like, well, what if I just create this show about an influencer who starts to influence real people in real time? time in ride shares one ride share at a time because she's like so self-absorbed and self-obsessed that she's live streaming while driving and she causes a car accident gets her license revoked and then has to go take uber and lyft to every cool event to like interview zach efron and ryan gosling and she realizes that these people in these cars they have the stories that matter it's not about the celebrity status or the fame or the glitz and the glamour it's like these people who she gets these 
connections with just from sharing a car with them. And even though she'll never see them again, she leaves their lives a little bit better than when they first started the ride. And they leave her a little better because she's lived offline every time she's around them. Then she puts down her phone and engages. And that's a very powerful thing that I think is far removed from society now. Like we all just need to put away our phones. That's why I love trivia too. Like I just think we need to engage and interact and we're like social beings and community driven. With that one, I'm trying to get funding from Uber or Lyft to the sponsor it. Series? Yeah, What's yeah. What's it called? Oh, so it's called Miss Narcissist. Nice. How do I watch yeah. it? So it's on IGTV. So if you go on BuzzFeed's IGTV, it's distributed on their platform. Like if you just click not at the pictures, but the videos and you like scroll down a little, you'll see some other people's projects too from the same program I did. It was called Vertical U and we just did boot camps at BuzzFeed. And I was actually, I think one of four scripted shows and there were 15 projects. So I think it just, I always still love scripted. It's yeah. like, that's what it comes back to. Yeah. Cause you could really flesh out the story and control it and give people the happy endings that they deserve. Okay, so you're going on acting auditions every day and it sounds like you're writing, producing your own series. Have you taken a break from hosting? So I'm still doing the trivia hosting and okay. I'm still going to do hosting entertainment news if they need me for award season. But also I'm trying to branch out to just interview at more places that will perhaps also like push me out of my comfort zone more. Because I had a gig where I was hosting this music trivia in studio show for YouTube and yeah. that was really fun. And then I also did like a live streaming hosting show where it was four women on a panel. I was just one chosen by the production company and of the four. And like live streaming was a whole new medium to learn from too. So if anything, I think at this point, I just really want to jump into more network opportunities or new media opportunities. Like I really love CCTV and entertainment news, but I think there's just so much to tap into in the hosting realm where I love this live trivia hosting that I do. I'm like, maybe I could be a game show host. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or maybe I could produce a dating show, like adapt a format, bring it to America. Or I could do like a travel show that incorporates like my love of baseball and sports. Like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I just, I really want to be pitching more unscripted shows too and hosting them. I just think, you know, it's always good to keep learning and growing. Otherwise, we're just doing the same thing over and over. You got anything else you're doing you have next? I guess, yeah. If you're in LA, come play trivia with me. I host Wednesdays at Goal Sports Cafe, which is like in between the Grove and Beverly Center. And it's really cute. Like Kevin Connolly owns the bar, I think, with like Leonardo DiCaprio's manager or something like that. I don't know. The Hollywood lore. But Kevin will come out here and there and play. He's fun. I just, yeah, I really love facilitating the fun and meeting people in person, face to face. Or people can follow me on Instagram, Sanyi Y. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed our interview with San Yu Yuen. I was blown away by how hard she hustles and her incredible positive energy. The entertainment industry is so tough, but I feel like she had the right attitude and the determination to succeed in it. You can find links to anything mentioned in the episode in our show notes at thenewschoolpodcast.com slash episodes. Stick around to the end to hear a sneak peek of next week's episode. To stay up to date on content, make sure to follow us on Instagram at The New School Podcast and on Twitter at The New School Pod. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, you could find your review on a future The New School episode. Do you feel like you or someone else would be an amazing guest on our show? If yes, please contact us on our website, thenewschoolpodcast.com slash contact. Want your ultimate guide on how to turn your passions into a meaningful career? Subscribe to our weekly newsletter at thenewschoolpodcast.com. The New School with Christine Hong is produced by Jenny Snyder and Tristy Biani. Editing by Sydney Salk, John Simpson, and Joseph Cho. Video editing by Josh Stanley. Special thanks to our marketing team who help us spread our mission and put the New School name out there. Katie Osaki, Emma Borgerding, Giovanni Cortez, Cynthia Shao, Dina Che, and Marissa Wolfsheimer. Next week, look out for Matt Miller, a pro skateboarder. Matt rode for the skateboarding brand Expedition alongside a notable DC Shoes as his shoe sponsor who turned him professional in 2010. It's super competitive. So many people skate and there's so many people that are good, but some aren't sponsored because they might do the wrong thing. They might have the wrong attitude. They might only never leave their local skate park. There's so many factors, but then when you're all around really good and you just, your level is above kind of the rest, then that's when you are 
kind of like a top pro and you stand out and you can make a really good career out of it, especially nowadays with all the opportunities. And like my friends are in the Olympics now, which wow. is crazy because skateboard is in the Olympic. Come back next Monday to find out from Matt how he created his first skateboarding trip, how he got his first sponsorships and 